Welcome to Chapter 9. Uh, in the, uh, on the website, I had said it was Chapter 10. If you saw that, that was my error. Chapter 9 is the chapter in the new textbook. It was the same information as was in Chapter 10 of the previous book. So we're going to be talking about patterns of inheritance. How do genes and chromosomes pass down their information from parent to child? So genetics, that's basically what we're looking at now, is looking at heredity. How is information passed down from mom and dad to child? An example on the slide is purebred dogs. They're exactly like their parents. But once you start mixing different types of dogs, you're going to have a mutt. And those actually technically are often healthier than the dogs of <coughs> purebred dogs because there is inbreeding. And as soon as you start inbreeding, genetic disorders can become more prevalent. So when we're looking at a dog's behavior or hours too, you're looking not only at genes, you're going to look at the environment too because there's a huge influence of the environment, diet, uh, what's outside, the sun, and it can influence uh, our genes. So we have to start from the beginning though for you to understand uh, heredity, which is actually the passing down of traits. Traits are characteristics like brown hair, blue eyes, uh, all those things are traits and you have obviously thousands of different traits and heredity is looking at how that is passed from one generation to the next. Now this work was all started by a monk uh, named Gregor Mendel. And he started his work in the 1860s. He actually grew up on a farm. And he had done a lot of uh, mathematical analysis of different plants. And he was trying to figure out what was passed down from parent to parent to child and so on. And when he started to do this study, he did not know genes existed, didn't know chromosomes existed. None of that had been discovered yet. So he did most of this by mathematical analysis and visual. And he used garden pea plants because first, they're very easy to grow. They have many different kinds of traits that he could play with, like color, uh, height, uh, leaf position, uh, and they are easily t manipulated. You can, and you'll see how he manipulated the passing on of traits from one generation to the next. And the one thing that these plants can do is they can self-fertilize. In other words, they have male and female parts in their makeup. So here is a picture of a pea plant and you can see of course the petals and they come in different colors and that's we're, one of the traits we're going to look at. But deep inside are the stamen which have the little yellow thing at the end. That's pollen and that is the sperm producing pollen. And then inside there is one larger carpal and that produces the eggs. So you need the pollen to fertilize the plant. And what Mendel did, he actually made the plants uh, just one gender. He cut off uh, the, the stamen so that he was able to manipulate what sperm fertilized the plant. There's a picture coming up of this. Okay, a couple of words, and you're going to see there's a lot of terminology in this chapter, 
there was a lot introduced in the previous chapter and they sort of continue on through. So a trait is something you inherit that is a feature, like eye color, uh, finger length, uh, your, the, the way your fingers are, how long are they? Are they long and skinny or short and uh, not that skinny? So there's many, many traits that we all have. That's why we're all so different from each other. Now, Mendel, what he did is the term true breeding means purebred. It's the same thing as a purebred dog. Uh, my, I had a Bichon. She just recently died. And she was a purebred dog. Purebred means that the parents had the exact same genetic material as the um, parents. And so they pass on the same genes. So purebred and true breeding mean the same thing, that no other species has had an influence on the traits of the plant or the dog. As soon as you get a mutt, they're not true breeding anymore. They're called hybrids. Hybrids are when you have two um, parents of different genetic makeup producing a child or offspring that is no longer identical to the parent or have the same traits and characteristics. It's actually a mix of the two now. Now, also, we have to keep track of the generations when we start looking at the plants. The parental generation is the first generation that we're going to be looking at, and that's called the P generation. Their offspring, which are going to be hybrids, are the F1 generation. Then there's one more cross. Cross means a mating of generations. Uh, when you mate an F1 generation with another F1 generation, you now have an F2 generation. So here's a picture of what Mendel did. Up at the top, number one. You see his hand and the scissors there? He removed the stamens from the purple flower. So he had a field of two different purebred flowers. He had white in one field and purple in another field. And they never had mated together. They never had transferred the sperm or egg to each other. They were purebreds. The white always had white offspring and the purple always had purple offspring. And they were far enough apart that the pollen didn't transfer over. What he did is he did a controlled experiment, and he controlled who got the pollen. So in turn, what he did is he removed the stamens from the purple flowers so they could no longer self-fertilize. Uh, they didn't have the male part anymore. So in order for them to have create offspring, they had to get the sperm from somewhere else. So what he did is he went over to the white flowers and he has a little brush there. That's what that picture is on the right, at, right above the number two. He um, brushed, got pieces of the pollen, went over to the purple flower and he brushed the pollen from the white plant onto the female part of the purple plant. So in turn, he was transferring the pollen from the white to the purple. And in turn, the purple now was able to, was pollinated, and inside the eggs matured into a pod, a pea pod. And you can see it there, number three. Those peas are the seeds that in turn have a little embryo inside of the offspring. 
and what happened there is the, all the plants from those seeds were planted in a new field so that there was no interference from any other uh, genetic pool and the offspring of this mating with the purple with the white that's the parental generation the generation that we're going to be looking at is the offspring of that mating and that is the F1 generation okay now this slide we are looking at uh, what's on page 147 in your textbook and these are the characteristics of the plants or the traits that Mendel studied and that we'll be talking about in this chapter. So basically, he developed four hypotheses from this F1 cross, the monohybrid cross. Remember, it was a purple with a white. It was only different for in one gene. So what he figured out is that there have to be alternative genes. Not all the genes are the same. So the genes that code for traits are going to look different from each other. They don't have the same um, makeup, chemical makeup, but they still code for the same trait. In other words, there are alternate versions of the same gene. There's a gene that codes for purple color and a gene that codes for white color. They are basically the same gene, but they have an alternate molecular form. For each character, an organism inherits two alleles or two genes. One allele from one parent, one allele from the other parent. Now, if the organism is homozygous, in other words, purebred, for the gene, then both of the alleles are identical. So in other words, the purebred plants that we first looked at, the P generation, they were homozygous because they had two genes, one from each parent, and both of them were identical genes. So they were purebreds. The two different alleles, the two different genes that they got, were identical to each other. But then when we get down to the F1 generation and you have a hybrid and the genes are different from each other and that's what we had with the hybrids, they're called heterozygous. So homozygous means that they have the same gene from each parent. They're identical. They're purebreds. Heterozygous their hybrids. Now, if two of the genes or alleles of an inherited pair differ, so now we're looking at the heterozygous state. So we're looking at the F1 generation. You get two genes, as did the, the purple plants in the F1 generation. They got the purple and they got the white. But what happened in the first generation is they were all purple. So we can assume that that gene or allele was dominant because the recessive is hidden. The, so the recessive allele does not demonstrate itself when there's a dominant allele present. But if two 
of the recessive allele are present, which is what the white plants were, then you're going to have the recessive trait show. The recessive trait will never sh demonstrate itself unless it gets two copies of it from both parents. And then the fourth hypothesis he, he had was that gametes, which are the sperm or egg, they only have one allele or one gene for each characteristic. The gametes, when they form, and this is what he's looking at, when the alleles separate themselves during meiosis, that you don't get two copies of the same gene from one parent you only get one copy of the gene from a parent. Remember, every parent also had a mom and dad and had two genes for the same trait sent down to them. We have two copies of every gene. But when our sperm and egg form, only one of them can go into the sperm or the egg that we create, the gametes. And that is called the law of segregation. You can't get two genes into the same gamete. If you remember, we looked at some problems when something like that happened. Uh, and a, a big example, not sort of an example, but maybe help clarify this, is the trisomy 21. There was a whole extra chromosome that didn't get separated from the other chromosome. So there were three instead of just one from each parent. One parent produced an extra copy, and that's not supposed to happen. Well, it's the same thing with your genes. Each parent has two copies, but only one copy is going to get sent into the sperm or the egg. And that's called the law of se segregation. Now, to show all this, he did this with uh, a Punnett square, which shows all of the possible combinations that can occur. First, we'll look at this animation to see if it shows. So this is showing the parents. Okay, so each parent, they're diploid. We have two copies of every gene. If you look here, this yellow and blue, the large one, one came from the mom, one came from the dad. So that's one chromosome. Then we have the small chromosome here. And here again, you have yellow and blue. The two blues came from the same parent. The two yellows came from the same parent. This is diploid. It's showing four chromosomes. And the haploid number is two. So if you go look at what happens when the gametes are formed, you can see that there are several combinations possible for each of the sperm or egg that are formed. They're haploid, and they get one of the large chromosome and one of the small chromosome. And also they swap material, as you can see here. Uh, don't worry about that, but that'll show you the different material, uh, the way they cross over material during meiosis, which you really don't need to understand the whole process of. But this is the result of meiosis occurring. Now we look at the other parent, because we're going to make babies with these. And here we've got two greens. Those came from one parent, and two reds. Those came from another parent. So this is a diploid parent. And these are the possible gametes that this parent could make. So what we're going to do is we're going to select a parent 
and watch what happens to the offspring. So let's take the two blues up here. And I am going to take this one, the red and the green. So when they mix, it's like there's a bag of parent one and a bag of parent two. You shake it all up with all the different gametes in it. And the two that get together produce a diploid offspring. So here you can see there's the long blue and the little blue, which came from the parent at the top, and the red, large red, and the little green, which came from the parent below. So now we have a diploid offspring. This is what we're looking at when we look at the Punnett squares. We're looking at the possible combinations that this offspring could be. So let's pick another two pairs. Let's go with the yellow, large yellow, little green, and the longer green with the shorter green. And look at the offspring. Totally different diploid offspring. It's going to have different traits. But look at the parent, the grandparent, so to say. That, I mean, that's where it all came from. And when the gametes form, it's by chance which two are going to result. But when we're looking at the formation of the gametes, we are looking at the large separating from the small, and none of these gametes got too large and too small. They got one large and one small. And that's, that's because each is a different chromosome. You don't get two copies of the same chromosome in the sperm or egg. We can look at one more. Here we have the yellow blue with the small blue. And you could see that in the offspring. And I didn't change the other parent. All I changed was the... Uh, one of the parents, parent one. And you can see that the offspring is a diploid there. Now we could go and pick this one. And it's by chance. You never know which sperm is going to fertilize which egg. Now you can assume this is the same as what happens to us, except we have 46 chromosome in our diploid state. And once our gametes form, the sperm and egg, we have 23 chromosomes. And they are all different from each other because they have to separate the chromosomes from each other. So you get a copy one, copy two, copy three, copy four of each chromosome. You have to have each chromosome from the karyotype in your gametes so that your child in turn gets two copies of every chromosome once you mate with another homo sapien.
Here's the P generation again. The genetic makeup is made up of alleles, alternate versions of the same gene. So we have one that codes for white and one that codes for purple. The way we indicate this with the two uppercase letters there, we're looking at the genes that are being passed down. So this purple flower makes only purple genes. We're only looking at color. So we, and it's the dominant trait, we've already presented that. And, and so when we represent the, gen, the genetic code for purple, we use two uppercase P's. With the white flowers, that's the recessive trait. So we indicate white by two lowercase p's. And remember, only lowercase two of them together of the recessive gene will demonstrate itself. And in the end, what happens is when you mate uppercase p, uppercase p with lowercase p, lowercase p, the only sperm or egg that the purple plant produces is uppercase P. The only sperm or egg that the white plant produces is a lowercase p. And in turn, you have an F1 generation that's heterozygous or hybrid and no longer purebred. It's got an uppercase P and a lowercase p. The white is hidden. It's a recessive gene. So this plant now is a hybrid. So now we're going to mate F1 with F1. Its genetic makeup is uppercase P, lowercase p. And when we uh, create the sperm and egg, they're going to create half of the genetic material that goes into a sperm will be uppercase P and the other half will be lowercase P. And they're showing the Punnett square right below here. Uppercase P, lowercase P. So here's the lowercase P. It came from that parent. So this is one parent. This parent produces uppercase P, lowercase p. They split in the law of segregation when the gametes are formed. So you have a gamete with uppercase P in it and a gamete with lowercase p in it. And it's going to be 50% because that's all we're looking at is the two traits. So when we get down to doing the Punnett square, we have uppercase P, lowercase p. That's from one parent and then we have the same thing on the other side. One will be from the female side and one will be the male side but they're both hybrids and they have the same genetic makeup and in the end when we look at the F2 generation we are going to when we do the Punnett square you pull the uppercase P down. So here's an uppercase P, here's an uppercase P. Lowercase P, you pull that down. Lowercase P, lowercase P. Now here you pull across. Here you pull across. And in turn, you end up with three quarters of the plants being purple and one quarter being white. So the terms that we're looking at here, you see phenotypic ratio and genotypic ratio. Phenotype is what you see. So it's sort of like a photo. So you can see there are three purple and one white offspring in the F2 generation. So the ratio is three purple to one white. Now the genotype is looking at the letters. 
or the genes. And that's what the letters represent. And in this case, you have one uppercase P, uppercase P, which is a purebred purple plant that's just like its grandparent from the P generation. Then you have two heterozygotes, uppercase P, lowercase P, just like the F1 generation. And all three of those are purple because the uppercase P is dominant. And then you have one lowercase p, lowercase p. And that's the white. And that is also purebred. It's homozygous. So the genotype ratio is one homozygous dominant purple, two heterozygous purple, and one homozygous purple white. So here this talks about again the terminology that I just used. The organism's physical traits or what you see are phenotypes and an organism's genetic makeup which is the letters that we've been looking at is the genotype. And we've already discussed homologous chromosomes. Homologous chromosomes are when you have two parents, both number one chromosomes from each parent are homologous chromosomes. Chromosome two from each parent, homologous. Chromosome three from each parent. If you go back to look at the karyotype, the picture of the karyotype, each of the chromosomes of the karyotype that are numbered one are homologous chromosomes. And homologous chromosomes have the same type of genes at specific locations on the gene. I have a picture of this coming up. So I'll show the terminology in a minute. But the genes are at a specific location on the homologous chromosomes. And alleles of the same gene, which are, alleles are just alternate molecular forms of the same gene, are at the same location. So here we are. We have a set or a pair of homologous chromosomes. Could be chromosome one. And one, uh, so you have two copies of every chromosome in every cell of your, in the nucleus. And you have one copy that you got from your mother and one copy of the same chromosome from your dad. So you have two copies of every chromosome. Those are the homologous chromosomes. Now, when we're looking at a chromosome, it's almost like they have a map on it. And the location on the chromosome is a specific location. And the genes that we're talking about, and here we're going to be looking at a couple of different genes, because your chromosomes have thousands of genes on them. And we're only, we've only been talking about purple and white. That's one gene amongst thousands. But if you look at the letter P, okay, the gene location for the purple color is right underneath the, the pinched in area. And notice that the location for the P is the same on both chromosomes. And in this case, the genotype of this parent is uppercase P, uppercase P. So they're homozygous for the dominant allele. Now when we go to this, the letter A, it's for a totally different trait. Could be for height. It could be for pea pod shape. Uh, or if we're looking at humans, it, it's just a different gene. And here we have two lowercase a's. They're on the same 
chromosome because they're homologous chromosomes. They're at the same location on each gene. And in this case, the two lowercase a's are the same gene because they code exactly the same. So their mole molecular form is the same. So their alleles are the same. And in this case, they're homozygous or purebred for the recessive trait. And they would express the recessive trait. Now when we get to the letter B, uppercase always indicates the dominant allele. So the dominant allele is the uppercase B. And you can see the location or the loci of the dominant allele B. And then you see the exact same location for the lowercase b. Now they have different molecular forms of the same gene. One is coding for the dominant trait, one is coding for the recessive trait. And in this case, the individual is going to express the dominant trait and they're considered heterozygous for the trait. 